For over a year, people in the Middle East have endured a level of devastation that far exceeds what any media coverage can fully capture. The ongoing war and humanitarian crisis in Gaza have claimed the lives of more than 42,000 Palestinians, with the actual toll likely surpassing 180,000 due to indirect deaths caused by the conflict and the sheer inability to document the daily carnage. Entire neighborhoods have been reduced to rubble, famine is rampant, Disease spreads unchecked and healthcare systems have collapsed under the strain of constant bombardment and overwhelming medical needs with little to no supplies while relentless Israeli military attacks persist. This war has spread beyond Gaza to the West Bank and Jerusalem where violent raids and settler attacks have become an almost daily occurrence and Lebanon where over 3000 people have been killed and over a million have been displaced. In Israel, families are still reeling from the devastating losses of October 7th and its aftermath, experiencing sh sheltering under rocket and missile fire, fire from Hamas and Hezbollah, the agonizing uncertainty of missing loved ones, and the emotional toll of hostages still unaccounted for. Much focus is rightly being placed on legislative efforts to halt the violence and find a path forward toward a ceasefire, humanitarian aid in Gaza, release of hostages, regional de-escalation, and a more hopeful future. As we work to achieve these goals, we must also give the human cost of this war attention. The voices of those most affected, especially the communities bearing the brunt of this violence, should and can be heard. As we continue our advocacy for the responsible use of US leverage to press Israel toward a ceasefire and negotiate an end to the war, we can draw strength and guidance from the voices of our own colleagues and allies, two women who represent the communities most impacted by this crisis. Shahed Safi and Odelia Matter are not only dedicating their time and energy to supporting the work of FCNL, but they are also deeply committed to the belief that real change can only come when the United States stops supplying weapons to Israel and begins using its influence to promote peace and accountability. So to introduce you to our two panelists who are up here to share their stories with us, Shahed Safi is a Palestinian journalist, Arabic English translator and teacher, and a human rights advocate from Gaza, pursuing a bachelor's degree in human rights and written arts. Shahed has been published extensively this past year as she documents her family and friends' experiences fleeing constant violence in Gaza, her own experience moving to the US during this horrific war, and the political processes influencing her loved ones' lives on the ground. Her work has been published in numerous outlets, including the New York Times, the Middle East Eye, Al Jazeera, and the LA Times. Odelia Matter is FCNL's program associate on the Middle East policy. She is also an Israeli American who grew up in Jerusalem and has since lived across the country. From northmost Israeli town bordering Lebanon, Matula, one of the towns, to one of the towns farthest south bordering Egypt and Jordan, Katora. Before working at FCNL, Odelia was a field and media coordinator for a human rights organization in the Negev Nakab region of Southern Israel, Palestine, and founded an organization focused on representational and solution-based media regarding the Arab Bedouin struggle for human rights. She also earned a BA in journalism from Sapir Academic College located in Sudarat, Israel, Sudarot, Israel. We are so grateful to have you both with us. Thank you for being here. And the first question is, could you share with us a bit about your upbringing and the places you were raised? Shahed, your life in Gaza and Odelia, your life in Jerusalem. Okay, so um, the thing is about the Gaza Strip is that it's a very specific experience. Um, my like exhibition in Gaza is that it was a very like 
I would say healthy community, aside from the escalations, the Israeli escalations on us, because I do remember that like, there were like a lot of things about Gazans like that is very special of which I, all the communities that, that like I was involved in, they were like, you know, goal seekers. They were very ambitious, like passionate people with a lot of like um, excitement about life, no matter what, like this was the norm in Gaza, that you have to do whatsoever it takes so that you get a dignified life because we know it's very competitive and we know that we are not in a in a place that is um normal so you know my my experience of the escalations is that um in 2007 i think it was the first escalation in gaza and or like 2008 i was 7 years old and um I do remember very well and very vividly. I will never forget it. The first Israeli warplane I've seen in the sky. I do remember like the first like bombing I heard and all of all of it like and like how I used to reach out to like my parents and I tried to ask them like what's going on. And I do remember how they were puzzled and like they would tell us things like to convince us that everything is normal, but it was never normal, you know. And like in a very in a very young like early age we realize that we are occupied and like we realize that um it, just like out of sudden at any moment there could be an explosion or like bombing and you could be the targeted one you could die i've seen it many times i've seen it growing up like in 2007 2000 and like i think 12 2014 um in 20 like uh, in my early 20s, like a lot of times, and like it was not only like these very specific escalations that were like, you know, very obvious. There were like times when there would be like an escalation in, in one day, and then nothing would happen for like, you know, a period of time, then explosion, then nothing, but like, and then intense escalations. My expression, like, my, ha okay, so. I used to think that a war is only like maximum two months, and I don't know why I developed this, but like when the genocide happened, and I remember when it started, I was like, it's not gonna take like more than three months, you know, like three months maximum. I naively did have this belief, and then it kept going, and I, I really couldn't believe that like it's taking all of this time. And up until now, it's like the longest genocide in history, the most intense, it's my people. The the way that I see Gaza is like, we really tried a lot to um, reach out to the world even before the genocide. We, like, I do remember, like, we used to meet a lot on like storytelling and how to like navigate the story, how to like bridge, you know, gaps between the West and East and, um, we were trying to use social media because it's like almost the only tool that Palestinians have in the widest urban area prison for them to like to really share their story. And when the genocide happened and it's like for the first time that we could reach this like big audience or I would say like, you know, globally our narrative is being shared of which like our story did not start in uh, on October 7th. It's way before. And you know, like I have never been allowed to travel out of this uh, outside of the Gaza Strip up until I became twenty three, um, and there were a lot of rules on like and a lot of restrictions and like limitations on um, traveling. For example, you can only travel for like two purposes, either medical or educational. So you can travel if you get a scholarship, or you can travel if you're sick. And even though this is the like what they claim is the norm, it's a lie. I've seen so many Palestinians dying because of like uh, rejected uh, permissions uh, or, but my friends like lost a lot of scholarships because just Israel like uh, denied the permission. Um, so in a nutshell, I, I would just say that it's a place of which wonderful people have tried a lot to reach out to the world, but nobody was listening. Mm -hmm. And finally they are, and it's sad that it happened this way. Thank you. I, I do want to ask you one follow up question, um, because we, Bridget, explained that we all have different definitions for different words. And so when you're saying the genocide, do you mean starting last October? Is that is that when you are describing using the word genocide? Is that what 
In the context I used before, mm -hmm. uh, yes, I meant that period of time, but of course, like the killing of Palestinians started way before, even way before 1948. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, um, can you hear me? The microphone is on. Um, thank you, Shahid, for sharing. I'm sure it's not, it's very tasking to share time and time again, and I'm honored to share the stage with you uh, as we have before. And I'll just say that my upbringing in Jerusalem uh, was, I'd say, almost 180 degrees from the experience Shahid shared and continues to experience and her family continues to experience. Um, although Gaza and Jerusalem are about an hour and 15 minutes away from each other in a car. Uh, and that kind of absurd um, negative of each other's experience is something that uh, is has been really hard to wake up from, but has driven me to be here today. Um, I grew up in an area in East Jerusalem in a neighborhood bordering Palestinian East Jerusalem. My neighborhood's name is Agmona Nativ. I had access to full basic human rights, freedom of speech, basic infrastructure, development, room to grow, room to study. I was able to travel freely around the world. Uh, and across the street from me in East Jerusalem, there are Palestinians who are stateless. They don't live in the West Bank, so they don't live under the Palestinian Authority. And they don't live within 48 Israel territory. They don't have Israeli citizenship. So they don't even have the right to vote for the government that dictates how their life will look like and what they have access to. And they don't have access to all basic human rights and they don't have freedom of movement. Friends of mine from East Jerusalem have never left this area um, and they don't feel safe. But it took me until I was 23 years old to really recognize that segregation. Segregation reminiscent of how my parents grew up in the United States between black people and white people. Um, discriminatory policies that my ancestors went through in Eastern Europe. And so I will say that an, an average Israeli's upbringing, I don't think I'm an average Israeli, but I do think my upbringing was characterized by growing up within the Israeli education system, being exposed to Israeli media. It's, it's really characterized by an underlying ignorance and giant blind spots. Something that was solidified later on in my life when I studied journalism in an Israeli institution, and we were never exposed to Palestinian spokespeople. We were never encouraged to echo a very basic story or truth that is happening literally across the street from where I grew up or an hour and 15 minutes away from where I grew up. And that continues and is the situation in, just in the media has deteriorated until today. It took me a very long time a ton of effort, uh, the privilege of speaking English and traveling around the world to really get to know Palestinians and hear something that was um, uh, something that I was denied my entire upbringing. Um, I also ha had uh, traumatic experiences as an Israeli living under violence. Mm -hmm. I spent um, many difficult hours of my life in shelters hearing bombs either drop or be intercepted. Uh, my first cousin survived a uh, suicide bombing when I was a baby. And I am so grateful that I know him today and that he's recovered, but eight of his friends died hmm. with him. Uh, friends of mine lost siblings throughout the years and different um, carrying out their military service. And that kind of stained a lot of, of uh, you know, our relationships and the trauma that they had been through. And up to October 7th, where I uh, suffered losses of friends and uh, new people who had been taken hostage. So I think Shahid's life and um, ha has been characterized by a lot of violence and I imagine uh, devastation. And I have experienced the cycle of violence and the continued lack of long sightedness as an Israeli growing up within the system that has never really come to terms with the fact that military means have never solved this problem. That what my dad went through as a younger person who moved to Israel and the violence that he had experienced has never been solved via continued military 
violence towards Palestinians. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I, for years, taught a genocide studies class, and we focused a lot on cycles of violence, as you both referenced. Um, and it takes a lot to interrupt them. And you have both been um, examples of that interruption in your lives. And Shahed, I know you have been working day after day to inform and educate the public by writing your experiences and the experiences of your peers in Gaza who've been devastated by the horrific price of this ongoing war. And Odelia, you work with us at FCNL. We are so lucky um, to lobby for a ceasefire and for hostage release, blocking arms to Israel and restoring UNRWA funding. Could you each share with us what brought you to do the work that you were doing today and why you have chosen these specific paths of advocacy, of interrupting these cycles? And what do you want U.S. lawmakers and the public writ large to understand about the situation in Israel-Palestine? Okay, so, you know, while you were, you know, responding to the question, you know, what I was thinking about is that the fact that I've never seen an Israeli in my whole life in the Gaza Strip, even during the genocide, I have never encountered any Israeli. And, like, I also, like, had a lot of questions, you know, but, and this like, you know, uh, comes because of the apartheid system that was, you know, implemented in the Gaza Strip because I was not even allowed to go to the West Bank. I was not allowed to go to any other areas um, in Palestine, even though I do have relatives in the West Bank and I've never been allowed to see them. Um, so coming back to your question about um, what I think that, what brought me to like to the conclusion that I have to speak up on Palestine is the fact that um, it's it's more of a responsibility. Like I grew up in this crazy place and I was always angry. Why is it this way? Like why I don't have like my eyes just like any Israeli or like just any human being, you know? And it felt very sad that like you know I remember when I joined We Are Not Numbers that was in uh, twenty nineteen. And one of the first things that we were discussing is that how, how the West does not know us. And like, it was really hard, but like, you know, being told that the West sees you as a terrorist, you know? And like, you need to prove that you're not, you know? Mm. And to me, the storytelling came through this way. I knew that like, there is a very, very wrong narrative about who a Palestinian is. And it developed the responsibility that they have to speak up and I have to like, to unfortunately, like, improve who I am as a Palestinian. I know who I am. I know I'm not terrorist. I know what the principles I have. And I know my story is, like, very specific because of the Gaza Strip. What made me who I am, and I always say it, is the Gaza Strip. And it always, what inspires me to, like, to give and, like, to work harder and harder. Gaza taught me this. Like, I, I say it. Like, oh, my God, we all were inspiring each other to, like, work more like the the youth community that like I've seen, we were going to like universities. We know the chance of us having jobs is like literally very, very minor. And we would do whatever it takes to like, to get a job in Gaza. So, and like, that means that we literally did a lot, a lot of things that we were not being given any credits for. But anyway, uh, you know, in the long run, like, and years came by, my experience of talking on uh, the Gaza Strip and, like, understanding uh, this huge gap between the West and East, it tried to, you know, it started to, like, um, I started to understand how to approach the West and, like, and share who I really am and, like, what Gaza is and what Palestine is and the amount or, like, the intensity of oppression that Palestinians have been put under, you know, throughout the years from before 1948, actually from 1917, from the British mandate up until now, you know? So what I think the lawmakers have to, to do is first of all, definitely, you know, I'm embargo to like cut, um, you know, to like stop sending weapons to Israel because there are so many children dying. There are so many people I know in person have been killed, friends, journalists, like, 
all kinds of people, you know, and like, you know, like it's 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 really very sad because like the amount of people I know have been killed is crazy. And like, it's even hard to grieve for them because I reached to a conclusion that I need to deny what's happening and disconnect to be able to, be able to like really, you know, go on in life. And I have no, I can't do it in any other way. This is my only like way of survival at the moment, you know? And it's bad, it's, it's, it's really very sad that I'm so disconnected from the Gaza Strip and I participated in this. And, um, but it, it will never like entirely happen because it's who I am again. So what I want like what I want to happen is for this aspire to to really like at the moment you know like stop because my cousins my uncles my some of my siblings are still there my father is still in the Gaza Strip and I know that at any moment I can receive the news of any of my family members being killed actually today in the morning uh there were like some distant family members killed in the Gaza Strip and like it's it's really very hard you know like why i know my family we have very good family you know why would that happen to them and the vast majority of people in the Gaza strip and yeah and other things that like we should keep talking on the Gaza strip we we really should start thinking about seeing palestinians as a humans who deserve like full rights the way that israelis do you know if you want to think about Palestine, Israel, you need to make sure that Palestinians are there in the picture as full, like as like literally as like you know the way that you view an Israeli because there is no any difference that can be there. And if you could notice any difference, that means that like maybe there is something wrong with like you know with the narrative that you've been taught. Maybe there is like propaganda that you need to like figure out how to overcome. You like everyone. Everyone, you should, you know, when you look at them, you should to see their humanity above anything else, you know, about them. And then educate yourself more and like really, you know, be, be informed about what Palestine is. If you know only one narrative of the story, maybe it's worth it that you look at the other side of it. Yeah, um, I, you know, it, to me, it feels like a really, there's a deep sadness around someone saying like what I want American lawmakers to do is to humanize. Mm -hmm. It's such a basic fundamental understanding. And I echo that. I hope that, you know, we can all do the work to, to further that. Uh, it should be basic common sense. And I'll just, you know, shortly say that what, what brought me to do this work is over many years, I'd been investing in human rights work in Israel, Palestine, in documenting human rights violations, demolitions in the Negev Nakab region in the south, in the West Bank, mass displacement and transfers of Palestinians and villages from the Safariata area in the southern Hebron Hills, writing, engaging in journalism. And I really tried to understand what will be the most pragmatic way to go about this. And I think that the, the source of the problem is the US provision of unconditional weapons and support mm -hmm. for this country to carry out things not only at the detriment of millions of Palestinians, but also of Israelis. And the second thing that brought me to do this work, I'll say is just selfishness. I really think that if Shahid has access to these rights and doesn't have to grieve, grieve the, the mountain of loss, my life will be better. The history has taught us that when neighbors have uh, equality and equity, they actually can form connections and be more fruitful and more generous and our livelihoods will be better. I cannot see why living uh, in an occupation, whether you are the occupier or the occupied is beneficial to anyone or in an apartheid system where you are the one invoking the apartheid or suffering under the apartheid there's just suffering all around it it i i cannot live in a country and witness my neighbors go through suffering and consider my life a good life so there's something selfish there and i also want to say that what, what i'm trying to express to lawmakers and i think you all should as well I had a meeting earlier today with several israelis pushing for these jrds 
there's a list now of 4,000 Israelis who have signed a letter calling on senators and calling on the international community to apply pressure on the Israeli government and sanction the Israeli government. As an Israeli, it's illegal for us to do that. And a minister in Israel has suggested to imprison us for 20 years for, for signing this letter to begin with. But we're, we're making the statement. We're, we've reached a point of desperation. And you know I hope more Israelis do as soon as possible to say uh, more hostages have been killed by the military than have been released since the beginning of the war. There is no military solution to what is going on. October 7th could have been avoided. We have a responsibility as Israel. It's not just pointing fingers at all of the other countries and all of the other entities and minorities and Palestinians for, for creating the cycle of violence. Israel is responsible for most of the violence going on for disproportionate amount of death and suffering. So as an Israeli, blocking weapons to Israel will, will bring forth more security for my family and for my friends. It will disable Netanyahu from continuing to exacerbate the conflict and the war, from continuing to expand the war into Lebanon now, into Syria, uh, into Jordan, Egypt, with Iran, uh, escalations with Iraq. This is putting my family and my friends who are Jewish Israelis at risk. So that's something I would ask people to amplify in these meetings. If you care about humanity in general, if you're doing the work to humanize and as you know, the FCNL community believes that there is that of God within everyone. Palestinians and Israelis need these JRDs to be supported. Palestinians and Israelis need Congress to send a clear message to Israel that it cannot continue without consequence. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to make a note about uh, each of your use of that term apartheid, which I think can come um, sometimes as a surprise to some in the U.S. who only associate that with South Africa. That's, I think, the, the way that we hear that the most. And there has been um, a significant movement, particularly led by the American Friends Service Committee, one of our partner organizations, around considering a range of definitions of apartheid and asking communities to commit to being apartheid-free communities and looking at those definitions of um, places where there are two different systems, two different sets of laws um, for different people and saying, let's let's be clear about where that's happening um, and really pointing to Israel and Palestine as a place where that is happening. So I, I appreciate your helping us to introduce people to how that term is being used now in a way that can, as you said, um, break through some of the propaganda where people don't understand the two different systems um, that can be in place. Um, as you talk about that, and as you talk about um, the work that you are doing to help all of us to see and understand the situation better, I think um, I speak for many of us here to say that you inspire us with your work and that you um, give us hope by your willingness to invest so deeply. And so the next question is, what gives you um, that inspiration to keep doing it um, in the face of such challenges in the midst of the devastation that is happening right now. Um, what brings you hope and where do you go for inspiration? And what else would you request of those of us who are advocating alongside you uh, for an end to the war? Okay, so I would love by say, starting by saying that I'm always very inspired by the experience in South Africa. And I do believe that um, there is a lot of things like in common between, you know, the apartheid system in South Africa and also in, um, you know, in, in Palestine, Israel. And I would say that I think it's important to mention that I don't have any connection to the Gaza Strip in heritage. In fact, my family members come from different areas from Palestine. Um, my my paternal uh, grandma she got, she comes from Yafa and like uh, my paternal um, uh, grandfather comes from Castina which is an area between Jerusalem and also the Gaza Strip on the coastal like area so it's very close where, to where you grow up and my mother's family are Bedouins they came from the southern areas 
from Palestine. So I've never been allowed to see any of these areas. I grew up in Gaza and like they were displaced. Like my, my father's family were displaced in 1948. My mother's family were displaced in 1967. At the moment I was displaced from the Gaza Strip, I have no idea if I will ever be allowed to see Palestine again or go back. And I'm too attached to my country. And, um, and it's very sad that it happened this way. And, you know, again, what I think can really be helpful to Palestinians is that speaking more, doing more of like advocacy for Palestine, more, more of civic engagement, everything that can really contribute to um, anything that is considered, you know, good on the human rights level or like on, I would say on a humanity level, because I kind of think that like people forget this when they talk about Palestinians. So I, I want to emphasize it many times. And um, we should never lose hope in like, in really any change. I think in the long run, if we keep like, um, if we keep pressuring, if we keep, you know, talking on Palestine, doing things for Palestine, there could be a day of which we can see like um, an area which Israelis and Palestinians, uh, you know, have like equal rights. Um, and I would say that like what really inspires me to like to not go sane and not lose hope is two things. First of all, is that I'm Palestinian and I have no choice because otherwise it means that like we lost it. And the other thing is that um, you know, like seeing what other people are doing for us, um, this a strong sense of solidarity is very important like i remember when i came to bard and i noticed how students are like very pro-palestinian like the vast majority of students at bard are very pro-palestinian and it's nice that i didn't have i did expect that i will be like trying to convince people that like i'm a human and all of that but what happened is that they were very very understanding and like they were very nice to me and like the amount of hope it gave me in generation c is like incredible and hopefully it contributes to something, to the solution, <laughs> hopefully. Absolutely. Yeah, um, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I will start by saying what gives me hope is the solidarity, I think, the network. And it's so broad, whether it be college campuses that you mentioned, and also the just incredible coalition that FCNL works with. There are over 100 national organizations represented in weekly calls that we have called the Ceasefire Now Coalition. This coalition meets, gathers, strategizes, pushes for legislation together. And one indication of the effectiveness of this coalition is that we had a Senate meeting last week and we, we asked them, what have you been hearing about the JRDs? And they told us, we're hearing overwhelming support for this legislation. They, they are hearing the voice of a movement. So we're part of this movement and our role in the movement is very important. I think that coalition work speaks multitudes. It's like Bridget mentioned, extremely diverse. We have interfaith groups across several different faiths and denominations within each faith. We have humanitarian organizers on the ground. We have groups that are working in the intersectional um, space uh, on freedom of speech, on equality and equity in the United States, in minority rights, in women's rights. It's just so incredible to see how everyone is meeting to promote this specific value of humanity and this specific legislation to, to prove it, to express that. Um, I, I, I find prayer really comforting these days. I find interfaith prayer really comforting these days, but also uh, I'm a Jewish person, I'm a practicing Jewish person, so sharing space with other Jewish people who align on this, which is something that I never had access to growing up, was awesome. And I mentioned this last QPPI, and I want to finish with this because I think it's like, I, I don't know, I think it's pretty awesome to be sitting in a room with people um, uh, representing different generations who are uniting around Palestinian rights. Another thing I'd never been exposed to, aware of, never been in a room like this back where I grew up, a room with younger people, older people, in between people, every age represented, who care about Palestinian rights. Um, it, it, it's incredibly isolating there to have 
that goal and to push for that effort. And just being in the room here today with people who have carried out work before me, with people whose parents or grandparents had carried out similar work before them, knowing that my children and their children might inherit this work, the sentimental glue that connects us all, I think that's been really strengthening. I, I, I feel um, like I'm not speaking on behalf of myself, my generation, my people, my religion only. I feel like this big uh, umbrella of solidarity and that's been super, super helpful. Beautiful. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who is a part of that. We are all doing this work together, hoping to amplify your voices and your stories. Final thoughts you would like to share with us? What do you want to leave us with? Stay hopeful, work more, and like, you know, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Stay hopeful, work more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I was gonna say the same <laughs> i think i think something that is important is as we move forward in this work there are people who are most impacted there are people who have the ability to maybe separate themselves from the outcomes of what's happening i encourage people to stay consistent in this work We've seen consistent, uh, consistency work in SCNL's Yemen work that I'm also really inspired by, especially in regards to JRDs that didn't seem likely to pass and then did pass. So, you know, my request is that this not be a single shot at pushing for legislation centering Palestinian rights and actually Israeli well-being, but that we continue doing this work as we move forward and just, you know, work hard. <laughs> <laughs> So beautiful, so powerful. I, I believe and FCNL believes that all of our liberation is <laughs> And I think you all have given us such a beautiful window into some of the ways that that is true. So again, thank you so much. Well, we will absolutely amplify your voices and your stories. Um, I am going to just make a quick announcement before we uh, dismiss to dinner, uh, which is that we do have designated listeners who are available if anyone has any concerns or processing that they'd like to do based on any of the content of what we're talking about. We know that it is weighty content. Um, and so just a reminder that online we have Sarah Avery, who is a designated listener for us during QPPI. Um, so folks online can reach out to her in the room. We have Megan Fair. Megan, are you in the room? Right? Yes, thank you. Um, and so if people would like to reach out to Megan about anything that they want to um, share or process about what is coming up for them, um, Megan is available for that. And if people want to share thoughts with all of the listeners, including the staff listeners, uh, which include myself and Linnea, who's up in the corner there, who's our anti-racism, anti-bias, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion manager on staff, um, we all will be reading that listeners at FCNL um, email account and we'll be able to respond to people if they would like to share any um, thoughts or questions there as well. Um, and so with that, I think maybe we should have a moment of grounding silence to um, seal onto our hearts and spirits all that we just heard before we are released to dinner. Thank you, friends. See you back here, 7.30? Who knows? 7.45? 7.45. See you at 7.45.